The topic is economic nationalism, the curse of economic nationalism. And it, uh, you know, part of it comes from my book on Hamilton, uh, which I called Hamilton's Curse. And because it was sort part of it is a response to the, a book written by a, a pretty well-known business historian named uh, John Steele Gordon. He wrote a book called Hamilton's Blessing. And because Alexander Hamilton, America's first treasury secretary, uh, once said that a large public debt is a national blessing. Uh, and uh, and his, his reasoning was very Machiavellian. There's a word for you. I looked that up on Google, the Machiavellian. Uh, that it, because his, his reasoning was that uh, if the government issues a lot of debt, it's mostly the affluent people of the country who have the money to buy the government bonds. And therefore, they will be tied to the government politically because they will be a, a permanent lobbying force for higher taxes to make sure there's enough money in the treasury to pay off the principal and interest on their bonds. That was his cha chain of reasoning. Because when the, when the Constitution was ratified, he threw a fit. He called it a frail and worthless fabric and spent the rest of his life trying to undermine the constitutional limits on government. Uh, when he was Treasury Secretary, he, uh, he badgered George Washington uh, by saying we need a government of more energy. He wanted government to be much bigger than what the uh, Constitution allowed for, and this was part of his scheme. So anyway, that's just sort of you know, why I came up with the title, Hamilton's Curse. It's, uh, you know, we, even to this day, we still have people writing books saying, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's, let's have a big government debt. Uh, look up online, uh, uh, you, you, the, the, all you young students, the National Debt Clock. Uh, it's, on, it's in Times Square in New York City, and it goes 1,000 miles an hour, you know, adding dollar after dollar after dollar, how much debt, and it even says how much uh, uh, you owe, you know, today, or, or how much a baby born tomorrow will owe already uh, if the debt were ever to be paid off. But anyway, that's why, uh, you know, the curse of economic nationalism. And economic nationalism is, is essentially, and always has been, a euphemism or maybe a synonym for mercantilism. Uh, really. And now, uh, and uh, Murray Rothbard defined mercantilism. This was the, sort of the economic system that prevailed in much of Europe in the uh, 1600s, 1700s, uh, uh, you know, up, up into the 1800s. And Murray uh, defined it as basically a system, a collection of policies that benefit producers at the expense of consumers and everyone else. That's, that's basically mercantilism. And, and I'll get into more detail in, in a little bit. And so uh, what I'm going to say for the rest of my time is uh, part economics and part history. I don't want to bore the Europeans in the audience with too much American history. I know we have some European students, but uh, so it will be some of that. And I'm going to start off again with uh, Murray Rothbard, a, a little s snippet from his book, The Mystery of Banking, which I highly recommend everyone read if you haven't uh, read it. And he remarks on the, uh, an really an incredible phenomenon that the American colonists fought a revolution to secede from this, the British mercantilist system. You know, the taxation without representation was their sort of their, their slogan. And they had been protesting uh, King George III's uh, mercantilist trade laws that discriminated against Americans. It was mercantilism. It was, you know, and, it was a set of policies set up to benefit British, politically connected British manufacturers at the expense of everybody else. And so they fought a revolution to secede against that system. But there was a group of Americans, uh, and very prominent Americans, wealthy Americans and influential Americans, who wanted to keep that system that they just fought an eight-year-long revolution to get away from because they understood that if you're on the, the money-collecting end of mercantilism, it's a good gig. If you're on the paying end, not true. It's not, it's not a good idea if you're on the paying end. But if you're on the, on the money collecting end, it's, it's a good thing. It's, it's good to be the king, as uh, Mel Brooks said in that movie, History of the World, Part 10, or whatever part that was, and when he portrayed the king of France. You know, someone, uh, one of his aides would come in and dump a big pallet of gold bars next to him. And he, his laugh line was, it's good to be the king. And, uh, and, and that, that's how I view the uh, Hamilton... Uh, uh, and the Federalists 
and who are the, who are the sort of the originators of American mercantilism? And here's what Murray Rothbard says in the Mystery of Banking about this: I mean, you know, it's economic nationalism or mercantilism. He said their purpose, and they were led by Robert Morris, who was probably a, arguably the wealthiest man in America. And he was basically a defense contractor during the Revolution. And he was the the big string puller behind Alexander Hamilton, the young Hamilton, who was still in his 20s at the time. He said their purpose was this, quote, I'm quoting Murray Rothbard, to reimpose in the new United States a system of mercantilism and big government similar to that in Great Britain against which the colonists had rebelled. The object was to have a strong central government, particularly a strong president or king, as chief executive, imagine that they just fought a revolution against the king, and they wanted, and, the, and the, a big uh, influential part of the American political scene wanted a king, uh, wanted to bring back a king, as chief executive, built up by high taxes and heavy public debt. The strong government was to impose high tariffs, to subsidize domestic manufacturers, develop a big navy to open up and subsidize foreign markets for American exports and launch a massive system of internal public works. In short, the United States was to have a British system without Great Britain. Sounds a lot like the Trump administration and the Biden administration, doesn't it? If you look at these, these policies that they're, they're talking about. And, and uh, mentioning, you know, speaking of Trump, by the way, his very first speech after he was elected on economics, he went to Lexington, Kentucky uh, and paid homage to Henry Clay. Henry Clay, the congressman, was the political heir to Hamilton, and he picked up the mantle of this mercantilist system after Hamilton died. Uh, I don't know if you all remember the history of this. Uh, Hamilton was shot dead by Aaron Burr in a duel. And uh, our friend, uh, our old friend Gary North told me once that uh, he started up an Aaron Burr Society once. And they had, they had ball caps, and the, logo, the slogan on the back said, not soon enough, was the, was the, the slogan on the back. So he wasn't a fan of, of, of Hamilton. Okay. So that's, that's uh, where this started, you know, the, the beginning of America, economic nationalism, which is uh, just basically a way of sneaking mercantilism into uh, the economy. And uh, Murray, Murray uh, goes on to uh, call... Uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, uh, Robert Morris's youthful disciple, his youthful disciple. So I call him his sort of political water carrier. He was, uh, it was Morris who sent Hamilton into uh, the Washington administration. And in the, the famous, uh, probably the most famous biography of Hamilton is the one by Ron Chernow. And this, this Broadway play called Hamilton is based, supposedly based on the book by Chernow. And Chernow himself, they gave him a small role in the play. And that play has made uh, $650 million so far, just on Broadway, not, not everything else, all the merchandise and everything like that. It's a very, very popular uh, uh, thing. And, uh, and Cherno writes about how, how uh, when, and when at the end of the revolution, Hamilton is uh, scheming to get a big job in the new George Washington administration you know, after the revolution. And... Uh, uh, Robert Morris wants to put him in as his tre treasury secretary, the first treasury secretary. Morris was actually the first. They called it superintendent of finance, and he had the first job. But then he wanted his man, Hamilton, in. And uh, George Washington says to Hamilton, I didn't know you knew anything about finance. We never talked about it. But if Mr. Morris wants you to have the job, uh, the job is yours. Ron Chernow uh, wrote that in, in, in his book. So Hamilton didn't really know anything. Here's what Chernow says. He says, you know, when he decided this is the job he wanted because Robert Morris told him that's the job you want, he said, since he didn't know anything about finance, he said, Hamilton brushed up on money matters and had Colonel Timothy Pickering, who was uh, 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 George Washington's uh, adjutant general in the revolution. He was also George Washington's secretary of state and secretary of war, a senator from Massachusetts later on, has sent him some primers that included tracts written by the English clergyman and polemicist Richard Price and his all-purpose crib notes, Postlewaite's Universal Dictionary of Trade and Commerce. So he read a dictionary 
That, that was Hamilton's education in economics. He read a dictionary of words, definition of words, just enough. And, and he was a very brilliant lawyer. And so you give a, give a brilliant, brilliant lawyer a new dictionary with all new words, he'll do something with it. He'll, you know, he'll, 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 he'll use it. Okay, Hamilton sent a marathon letter to Robert Morris that set forth a full-fledged system for shoring up American credit and creating a national bank, says Ron Chernow. And I read this letter. I have it. I cite it in a, in a paper of mine. If, if anybody's interested in it, I'll, I'll give you the citation. And despite all these uh, references that he said that he read, he basically said this, what, uh, what we need to have is protectionist tariffs, a central bank, taxes on land, poll taxes, and a large public debt. That's it. That was in the letter. That's, that's what he learned from all, the, all this, the total sum of Alexander Hamilton's economic education. That's, the, that's what he got. Now, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, there was an article that I, I posted a blog on lourockwell.com about how the Biden administration is giving the, uh, the Puerto Rican socialist, who, uh, who's the director of this play on Broadway, Fifty million dollars. Okay, they've already made six hundred and fifty million just from the play alone. Not to mention all the merchandise and everything else, and TV rights and all this. And they're going to give them fifty million because during the the lockdown, they couldn't have put the play on on Broadway because New York City was locked down. And so to compensate them for that, they're giving them fifty million dollars of taxpayers' dollars. And so I, I blogged about it, and Lou liked it so much he. He asked me to turn it into a short article, and so it appeared as a blog and as an article. And the title I gave it was Corporate Welfare for a Play About the Founding Father of Corporate Welfare. <laughs> and, uh, so, so the establishment, the leftist establishment, loves Hamilton, you know, the founding father of, of mercantilism, of uh, fascism, basically, you know, sort of a combination of business and, and, and government. And so... Uh, so I'm not going to tell you the whole story about uh, how, how this all came into being. I'm, I'll tell you part of it. Uh, the corporate welfare part of the story is it, Hamilton, you know, he, he and the Federalists, they picked up the mantle from the British mercantilists who they, who they learned from. And Hamilton, by the way, grew up in, in St. Croix in the Caribbean. And he, uh, he never knew, supposedly never knew who his real father was. His, his, his mother gave birth to him without a father around. But then he, uh, he worked as a clerk for some British slave-owning plantation owners in the, in the Caribbean. And they sent him to what is now Columbia University. And I suspect, I have no evidence of this at all, I suspect that one of the slave owners, British slave owners, was probably his father. You know, yes, he was a brilliant guy, but geez, they they sent him to New York. They paid for him to go to school in New York. That's something a father would do. And so, I, so that's what just a, as a tidbit about Hamilton. And so, so he's beloved by um, the left and the right. Uh, when, when my book came out on Hamilton's curse, uh, my my publisher, Random House, wrote such a good press release that uh, the Morning Joe television show uh, immediately sent a limo to my house to pick me up at six o'clock in the morning to put me on the TV show, the, the Morning Joe TV show, because it was right after the crash of 08. And, and they sent me down next to Pat Buchanan. And, and Pat, the first thing he says to me, he looks at me and he says, Alexander Hamilton is my hero. And so, and so here I read, I just wrote, they had me on, I wrote a whole book trashing Alexander, Alexander Hamilton. And so it was pretty much a shouting match. They even brought in, uh, the three of them kind of, kind of yelled at me for a while and wouldn't let me talk. And that wasn't enough. They went. They brought some guy from New York in on a screen to have him blabber, blabber away. Uh, and, and so, anyway, so uh, and I think I made some. I just sat there and made some smart comment about Aaron Burr at the end of it because it was futile you know, to, to say anything. Okay. So the corporate welfare story, though, uh, Hamilton chambered that they called it internal improvements. Today they call it infrastructure spending, government subsidies. Uh, Jefferson was opposed to it. He didn't go along with it when he was president. He said that you have to amend the Constitution first. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, when he was president, the very last thing he did in office was veto a spending bill that included some money for uh, road building. He said it's not one of the delegated powers 
therefore the, the government cannot spend money. James Monroe, same thing, he vetoed it. So, so president after president uh, vetoed it. And it was almost, almost uniformly Southerners who, uh, who vetoed these things. Not, not 100%, you know, there, were, there were Southern mercantilists and there were Northern free traders in America and Northern li more libertarian ordered, oriented. But, they're in the, in, but in the North, they were in the minority and in the South, they're the majority as far as opposing all, all of this, this thing. So they didn't get any federal subsidies to speak of for corporations. Uh, uh, Hamilton failed at that during his time. But then the states, the, the, the same uh, uh, political uh, organizations uh, went after the states and, and, and state after state adopted uh, government uh, subsidies for road building and canal building during the 1810s, 1820s, 1830s. And uh, it turned out to be a total debacle. By the time you get to uh, the Civil War era, uh, there's a book on this by a, a, an author, a historian named Goodrich on uh, internal improvements, they called it back in those days. And he says, by the time you get to the, the American Civil War, 1860, every state in America had amended its constitution to prohibit government subsidies to corporations for anything. Uh, in, in Illinois, for example, uh, Lincoln himself, when he was in the Illinois legislature, uh, got the legislature to uh, allocate $11 million for road and canal building. This was 1837, long before he ran for president or long before he, he, he didn't utter a single word about slavery for another 20 years after that. And uh, so they spent all this money, much of it was stolen, and not a single road was completed in the state of Illinois. So the people of Illinois were put in a, in a debt for the next several decades to pay off that $11 million in 1837 dollars uh, for there. And every other state did that except the one exception, the only state that did not amend its constitution to prohibit this was Massachusetts and they, before the, uh, the Civil War you know, era, you know, 1860. So they did do some, have some success there. And uh, the closest they came to succeeding in adopting the system of protectionism, corporate welfare, and a national bank uh, was in, uh, in 1840, uh, Henry Clay was in charge of the Whig Party in Congress, a very influential uh, man, and, uh, and they had the votes in Congress, and they, elect, they finally elected a Whig president, um, Lou Rockwell's favorite president, William Henry Harrison, also my favorite president, because uh, William Henry Harrison uh, was inaugurated and died a month later, and so he couldn't have done much damage. So that's, that's why he's our favorite president. And, uh, but, and uh, but what happened was his, uh, his vice president was John Tyler. Now, there's a libertarian who wrote a book uh, called uh, Recarving Rushmore. Ivan Eland is his name. Independent Institute published this book. And he ranks all the presidents. You know, the history profession in America has all these rankings of American presidents that they come out with from time to time. And their criterion are usually whoever uh, racks up the biggest debt, raises taxes the most, and gets, gets us into the most wars that kill the most people, those are the greatest. Lincoln, Roosevelt, Wilson, always at the top, always at the top. Ivan Elin did the opposite. Now, you know, which presidents did the best job at protecting life, liberty, and property? You know, that's, a, that's an odd thing to think of, isn't it, for a government to, to try to do. And, uh, and, so, and, and he puts John Tyler number one. Okay, Lincoln, Roosevelt, they're all way down there at the bottom of his list. Why does he put John Tyler number one? Well, the Whigs uh, uh, apparently just uh, had John Tyler as their uh, vice president because uh, their, their campaign theme was Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. Tippy, there was a, uh, William Henry Harrison was uh, the hero of the Battle of Tippy Canoe, wherever that was. Uh, and uh, so that was one thing. And Tyler too kind of rhymed with that. And so they, <laughs> let's make him our vice president. And, uh, but he turned out to be a Jeffersonian. And he vetoed everything. He vetoed a bank bill. He vetoed protectionist tariffs. He vetoed the internal improvement subsidies program. And so Clay and the Whigs threw a fit. They, they burned uh, John Tyler in effigy in front of the White House and kicked him out of the Whig party. So he was a president for four years, but he was, didn't have a party affiliation. They kicked him out. And, uh, and so that's, that was a big feather in his cap, wasn't it? A badge of honor that, that he did that. So that didn't uh, succeed either either. Um, protectionism. Uh, Hamilton 
uh, in my short little article on lourockwell.com, I call Hamilton an economic ignoramus uh, because the, the establishment says the opposite. They say, well, he was an economic genius who created the American economy as though one man, uh, you know, he was like an early uh, Klaus Schwab, you know, who they think they can, you know, push a button and, and the, the, there, there's the economy, we reset the whole economy, push the reset button and, we, and we've got it. And, uh, and they say things like that. Uh, but of course, that's nonsense as far as that goes. But on protectionism, he read the pamphlets by British mercantilists and he called, he called uh, transportation costs useless labor. And he argued that anything that involves transportation costs should be banned. Uh, it shouldn't, should not be allowed to be imported into the United States. So if a man in England uh, sells shoes and he wants to compete uh, by shipping the shoes across the Atlantic Ocean and selling them in New England, shouldn't allow it. It should be outlawed to, to do that. He also argued that uh, competition will cause higher prices because, because after all, competition costs businesses money. It costs money to compete. And when you, when you have spend that money to compete, you know, maybe you pay for advertising, for example. Uh, well, then prices are going to go up because the costs go up, prices are going to go up. And that, was his, that was his reasoning. And uh, that was sort of the, 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 the total sum of John Kenneth Galbraith's economics also. Uh, you know, he was a big critic of advertising uh, and during his whole career. Uh, and that's that's what, he, what he was known for. So he had all these oddball, goofy ideas. And, and uh, Abraham Lincoln adopted the exact same arguments. And if you, there's, his speeches on protectionism were pure Hamiltonian. He was, I call him the political son of Alexander Hamilton. And so we finally got all this. After all the vetoes that, uh, by, uh, by Madison and Monroe and other presidents, uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, of, of some of this, uh, we finally got uh, protectionist tariffs during the, the American Civil War. Uh, 1857 was sort of the high watermark in America of free trade in the 19th century. The average tariff rate was only 15%. Uh, but by the time the war was over, it was about 60%. And it remained there until the income tax came in in 1913. So that was that was not just a war tariff. It was, it was the policy of the Republican Party. They finally got uh, protectionism that they, that they wanted. Uh, Murray Rothbard also writes very favorably in, in his History of Money and Banking in America about the Jacksonians. And uh, every time I write something on the web about Jackson, you know, he did some good things and some bad things. So every time I write anything good about Jackson, I get bombarded with emails by people saying, don't you know he killed all those Seminole Indians in Florida? Well, yes, when he was a general. Yeah, he, was a, he was a military general, and they, they were, so tried to eradicate the Seminoles from uh, the state of Florida, for what is now the state of Florida. Yes, yeah, so he's a, he did some bad things. But, uh, but you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to agree with everything Andrew Jackson ever did in order to praise him for the good things he did. You know, condemn him for this sort of stuff and praise him for the, you know, say that it was a good thing that he did other things. The, 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 the best good thing that he did was he uh, vetoed the rechartering of the Bank of the United States. And this was Hamilton did succeed in convincing George Washington to adopt, to adopt a national bank, uh, the Bank of the United States. It, it had a 20-year charter, and it was modeled after uh, the Bank of England. And here's what uh, Hamilton said about this. Uh, <clears throat> well, Murray actually said the central bank was the keystone of the whole thing. And here's what Hamilton himself had said about his bank. He said, Great Britain is indebted for the immense efforts she has been able to make in so many illustrious and successful wars because of the existence of the Bank of England. So, yay, we have, we have a bank that can, uh, that can expand the money supplies and make it cheaper to get into, to be an imperialist in, in Europe. And he, he spoke about imperial glory. He said, the tendency of a national bank is to increase public and private credit, and the former gives power to the state for the protection of its rights and interests. Okay, exactly. That's exactly why the Jeffersonians opposed them. They, they didn't want something to aggrandize the state, but Hamilton did. That's, and, that's, and that's why um, the, the Pat Buchanans of the world, you know, the conservative, the right-wing statists like uh, Pat Buchanan, as well as the left-wing statists uh, worship uh, Hamilton so much. He's one of them. And, uh, and he, was, he was a brilliant guy, and, uh, and which is why 
Jefferson uh, feared him so much. He knew he, was, he had these devious plots in mind, and he was brilliant, and that's a dangerous combination. It's a good, good recipe for a tyrant, uh, as far as that is concerned. So Andrew Jackson vetoed the rechartering. The, 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 the bank was, let, uh, was not rechartered after the first 20 years, but then the War of 1812 came, and they, that was used as an excuse to monetize the debt from the war to bring back the bank. Uh, in 1817, January of 1817. And then it was up for a rechartering again, and it was Jackson who vetoed it. And this is one of my favorite uh, political speeches, American political speeches, is uh, Andrew Jackson's veto of, of the bank. And I, and I can't resist reading to you just part of it. It is to be regretted that the rich and powerful too often bend the acts of government to their selfish purposes. Could you imagine a American president saying something like that today. Although, I will say, Trump's first inaugural address was great. When he was sitting there, he had George W. Bush sitting there, and Clinton was there, and he was just ripping them all a new one, as the saying goes, and, 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 I, and they were all making eyes at each other. I remember watching this on TV, that uh, Bush and Clinton were all you know, rolling their eyes at each other over this. But he was saying things like the Washington establishment has become, has made itself enormously rich at the expense of you, you know, the people. And oh my God, that's uh, speaking the truth. Uh, distinctions in society, this is Jackson. Distinctions in society will always exist under every just government. Equality of talents, of education, or of wealth cannot be produced by human institutions and government. But every man is equally entitled to protection by law. But when the laws undertake to add to these natural and just advantages, artificial distinctions, to grant titles, gratuities, and exclusive privileges, to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favors to themselves have a right to complain the injustice of their government. So he was saying that this bank, this is what this bank was doing. It was creating exclusive privileges for the, the rich politically connected. And therefore, he, uh, he vetoed it. And when I wrote this, when I, when I included this in my book, I went out and I gathered some history books because I wanted to see, well, what, what does the American history profession say about this? You know, if you, if you were to go to college and you take an history, American history course and you read about this, what are they saying? And the books that I found uh, were sort of universal condemnation of Andrew Jackson for, for saying this, saying these things. You know, if, you're, if you have any libertarian leanings, you would think, well, this is fabulous. This is a, this is a, great, a great statement. But the American history profession, the books I saw were uniformly really nasty uh, uh, critiques of all of this, okay? And so on the issue of uh, protectionism, you know, as I said, by the time you get to 1857, uh, there was no bank. We had free trade, uh, basically. Uh, the tariff rate was 15%. No federal corporate welfare to speak of. And, uh, and the states had all outlawed state-funded welfare, well, outlawed it, uh, all except for Massachusetts in the United States. And so, but that all radically changed very quickly. Like I said, uh, the Lincoln administration uh, adopted 60% tariffs and kept them in place for 60 years. And also, the first big uh, massive uh, corporate welfare boondoggle came into being with the government subsidies of the uh, transcontinental railroads. They created two government subsidized railroads, uh, the Union Pacific and uh, Northern Pacific. And, uh, and Lincoln, Lincoln, by the way, one of the stories about Lincoln was that in 1857, you know, long before he ran for president, he was a wealthy uh, a railroad lawyer. He was the general counsel for the Illinois Central for a while. He represented all the big railroads in the Midwest. He was offered the job of general counsel of the New York Central Railroad. He traveled around the Midwest in a private rail car, courtesy of the Illinois Central, with an entourage of executives uh, from the corporation, which at the time was probably the biggest corporation in, Amer in America, uh, the Illinois Central Railroad. And, uh, and that's what it was. And he invested in land in Council Bluffs, Iowa, and, uh, at the time, of all the places, Council Bluffs, Iowa. And uh, when he became president, the first thing, one of the first things he did was, uh, you know, the war was on. I mean, the Confederate Army was massing in Manassas, Virginia, 
and he calls Congress back. Congress was out of session. He calls Congress back in June, you know, right before the you know the big this big first big battle was about to occur. And the purpose of calling them back was to get the ball rolling on the Pacific Railroad Bill. <laughs> so that's the purpose, which they did. And the Pacific Railroad Railroad Bill gave the president the exclusive right to determine the eastern terminus of the uh, Transcontinental Railroad, where they were going to start building Transcontinental Railroad. Anybody know where uh, Abe Lincoln chose? Uh, I'm going to take a guess where he chose to start building the railroad. Council Bluffs, Iowa. What, what a coincidence. He just happened to, it was still known as, a, I think it's called Lincoln's Hill now in Council Bluffs, Iowa. So he must have made a fortune uh, in, in real estate speculation uh, by, by, by doing that. That's, that was, talk about insider trading. That was, that was a, you know, a real political insider trading. Okay, and so so that happened, and if you want to read an interesting story on a, in my book, How Capitalism Saved America, I tell the whole story of how James J. Hill uh, publi uh, published, James J. Hill uh, created the, and, and his business partners created the Great Northern Railroad that built a transcontinental without any government subsidies, even land grants. They paid the Indians for rights away with cattle or whatever they could trade for in, in, the, in the plains. Whereas the government subsidized railroads, uh, if they ran into the Indians, they would call in the army to kill all the Indians. And in fact, uh, General Sherman himself, after the Civil War was over, was put in charge of uh, the Indian Wars for 25 years, from 1865 to 1890. And the purpose was to just eradicate the Plains Indians from the Great Plains to make way for the railroads. That's, those, are, those are Sherman's exact words, to make way for the railroads. Uh, and they did. They ended up killing some 45 or 50,000 Indians, and the rest were put into concentration camps called reservations in, uh, in, in the West. But it, was, but it was a form of corporate welfare. It was a, just a veiled form of corporate welfare for the railroad corporations, which were the, the financial lifeblood of the Republican Party at, at the time. Should sound familiar to today. You know, it's same, you know, some things never change, do they? So, so that, that took into place, you know, the biggest scandal in American political history up to that point, the Credit Mobilier scandal took place. And uh, I don't have a board here, but the, uh, the roots, uh, it's kind of comical to see the roots. James J. Hill, uh, you know, he's a private entrepreneur, privately funded entrepreneur. So he had to, he had to find the shortest, quickest route to the West Coast, which he did. He, uh, he hired some engineers who, who discovered the Marias Pass through the Rockies, which was, had been discovered by Lewis and Clark in 1803, and no one had ever found it after that. And his engineers found it, and it cut 100 miles off his route, which was, you know, gold you know, back, back in those days. You know, it was worth a lot of money. Whereas if you were to look at a map of the, the, uh, the government-subsidized railroads, it, it looks like a bowl of spaghetti, because every member of Congress would say, if you want my vote for more subsidies, you have to run a line over to my town of 500 people over here, and then over there and over there. So if you look at the, there is a map online of you know, the Union Pacific uh, you know, line, and it's all over the place. And you think, you know, what, what insane person decided to try to make a profit by, by having this kind of railroad and with all these extensions in the middle of nowhere where there's like no customers hardly, you know, and maybe the congressman himself would be the only customer. I don't know, that's, it. that's possible. So that happened. My, my students used to always uh, laugh get a big belly laugh out of that because I would put it on a screen. Because I, I, I put the, the map of the Great Northern, you know, it's like a straight line across the Rocky Mountains, and then the Union Pacific is the big bowl of spaghetti. And it's, it's kind of ridiculous. Okay. Now, and so uh, economic, that's why, this is all why I call it the economic nationalism a curse. The Hamiltonians have basically won the argument. It took a long time. They didn't, they didn't have any success at all to speak of until the Civil War. And that sort of waxed and waned. But if you look at today, uh, you know, one of the first things President George W. Bush did was to impose steel on tariffs. Trump did the same thing. Uh, the Democrats are historically protectionists because of the unions, uh, as far as that goes. Trump was, uh, like I said, his first economic speech was in Lexington, Kentucky, to pay homage to uh, another founding father of uh, mercantilism and economic nationalism, Henry Clay, he was in favor of uh, the same things, protectionism, corporate welfare, subsidies, various subsidies to corporations. 
and, and internal improvements. You know, remember Trump proposed a trillion dollars in infrastructure spending, and, uh, and, and Biden is doing the same thing. So this is the system that we've adopted, economic nationalism, which is really uh, 21st century mercantilism. Uh, it's, it's no different uh, than, than any of that. And so uh, that's my story for today. And, uh, and then we have some time for a Q&A if you have questions uh, about this, uh, comments, uh, anything. Yeah. You can applaud if you want to. He has his... Uh, uh, he was, he was kind of, uh, uh, uh. Yes, sir. What do you think of Malice's argument that Hamilton was a good founding father because of his monarchist tendencies and monarchism is a better incentive structure than democracy? <clears throat> Michael Malice praises Hamilton because he was a monarchist. That, that, yes, that's one of his arguments. Yeah, I had a quote here from, uh, let me see if I can read you a quote from Ham Hamilton himself. Yeah. Here, here's what Hamilton said. He, this is a quote from Hamilton. I was among the first who were convinced that an administration by single men was essential to the proper management of the affairs of this country. So he did advocate a permanent president. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure why that would be a, a good idea. They, I mean, they, uh, uh, th you know, if you if you ever read the law by Friedrich Bastiat, if I recommend everybody read it. If you haven't read the law, read the law by Friedrich Bastiat. Um, and, and he makes the point that and he's criticizing socialism. And he says, well, you can have socialism with a, a dictator or you can have socialism with a democracy. If, if, a, if a Congress votes for some law that is uniform and everyone is compelled to obey that law, that's law for socialism, how is that different than if a king decrees the same law? And so, uh, yeah, you can have a, a monarchy that is evil and corrupt, I and mean, you can have a monarchy that's not. Now, uh, Hans Hoppe has written a whole book, the Democracy of the God That Failed, making the case that the incentive system in democracy inevitably evolves into socialism and all these bad things, and whereas at least, at least the king owns the property and he's not apt to destroy his own property. I don't know if Michael Malice makes that argument. Yeah. He, he does. Yeah, but then if you look at history, there are there are a lot of examples of kings destroying things. Uh, Joseph Stalin was probably the richest man in America in the in the world during his time because he he essentially owned all of Russia. You know, he was he owned all of Russia, and he was not a very productive guy as far as that is concerned, as far as being a king. And so, yeah, king can be another word for dictator. And so it depends on what kind of culture you have and what kind of beliefs people have. You know, some of the some of the Middle Eastern uh, kings are not not too awful compared to uh, Chuck Schumer, let's say, or <laughs> something like that. One of my students was mentioning Chuck Schumer. One of my students who came to Mises U years ago was in the Marine Corps before he came. Well, he even went to college, and he ended the, he ended his career in the Marines as a sniper instructor. And our friend, the late Ralph Rako, once said to him, his name was Ken. He said, Ken, could you point, could you pick out Chuck Schumer out of a crowd? You know, this is a Marine Corps sniper, he's asking that anyway. This is time I did. So, but I don't, I don't, uh, so that's, that's my answer to your question. I don't, you know, you can have a, a bad, bad, bad king and a, and a good king. So it's, it's not uh, set in stone. But Hamilton overall uh, was a disaster. He, he, uh, he invented the legal argument for implied powers of the Constitution during his debate with Jefferson over the constitutionally, constitutionality of National Bank. He was the first one to lay out the legal argument for how to go about perverting the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, as Judge Napolitano talked about the other night. And so that's, that's what I meant, meant when I said that he spent the rest of his life after the Constitution was ratified trying to undermine the Constitution by, by providing this. And his, uh, one of his followers was John Marshall. Was, uh, he was the Chief Justice for 36 years. And some of John Marshall's uh, uh, decisions were almost verbatim from Hamilton's speeches on, on how to pervert and, 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 uh, and destroy uh, the true meaning of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution, for example, almost word for word. He was slavishly devoted to, uh, to the uh, ideology of Hamilton, who was the leader of his party, you know, the, the sort of the Federalist wing of, uh, of American politics. And so, uh, you know, I call him, uh, you know, in my book, I call him the, there's, there's a woman, uh, uh, 
political scientists who wrote an article in the 1950s called the, the Rousseau of the Right, and that was Hamilton, and he called Hamilton the Rousseau of the Right. So if, you, if, you, if you're a fan of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the, the philosophical father of communism, then, uh, then uh, maybe you should ask Michael Malice if, uh, if he's also a fan of Rousseau, because, because, because Hamilton was the Rousseau of the right, philosophically. Let's see, how about in the back? Uh, yeah. You said that the Bank of the United States was modeled after the Bank of England. Is there any evidence that the Bank of the United States was modeled after the Bank of England? Uh, oh, I don't think so. Uh, I've never run across it. I mean, uh, uh, these people, you know, Morris and these people, uh, they were Americans. Uh, they wanted, they knew it was a good scheme, and they wanted it to be their scheme. And I don't know why they would uh, hand it over to some British uh, bankers and, and let them pocket the profits from their scheme. They wanted to pocket the profits from their scheme. They wanted, they wanted. Uh, 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 British style mercantilism run by Americans, by, by them. And so, uh, so I don't, uh, you know, there are all these theories out there about, uh, there are all kinds of theories uh, about, uh, you know, British bankers being sort of puppet masters of Robert Morris, but I've never seen any evidence, any evidence of that. And uh, I, I get emails all the time, especially when I used to work at a Catholic university, uh, accusing me of being a, a, a tool of the Pope, just like. Jefferson Davis was when you want to write about Lincoln because he he sent his children to Catholic school so therefore somehow this theory is out there that it was really the Pope who orchestrated the Civil War because the, the Catholic Church wanted to take over America and then there's this other theory that the British bankers really orchestrated all of this and they, they, it was them that wanted to take over America but but they lost the revolution if they're so powerful why didn't they win the revolution and the, and the British bankers. Um, yeah, the man in the way back had his hand, hand up first, I think, in the background. Uh, one of my heroes is Aaron Burr, the first creation of the best day of Hamilton's life. Uh, I have yeah. a question on that topic. Uh, do you have a, a, any takes on the treason trial of Aaron Burr and that unusual Mexico scandal? Uh, do you know what, what was going on with that? Or? Um, I never really uh, uh, booked up too much on Aaron Burr. There, there's a... Um, there's a woman who writes uh, blogs a lot for lourockwell.com, Becky Akers, who wrote a book on Aaron Burr, and she sort of she defends Aaron Aaron Burr. So if you if you're not familiar with Becky Akers' book on uh, on Aaron Burr, you should you should look it up if you if you're interested in this. But uh, but I suspect that he was uh, scapegoated. Uh, you know, anybody who uh, challenges Alexander Hamilton to a, Hamilton to a duel uh, must be a good guy in my book. <laughs> so, uh, yes, ma'am, the lady in the back. What do you think, like, with high-speed rail and all the money around trying to get the government to promote it, do you think that we see the same chaos that we saw with the original railroads? Oh, high-speed rail? Yeah. The, well, the whole history of government uh, railroads is pretty bleak, isn't it? I mean, Amtrak is, has never made a penny in profit. And so you could call it high-speed rail. It sounds, it sounds, you know, high-tech and uh, futuristic, but it's still going to be run uh, by government and government bureaucrats if it's a government program. So it's in, in uh, and so you know, in, in in government you don't have the free market feedback mechanism that rewards with profits uh, efficient behavior and penalizes with losses bad behavior. In fact, it's just the opposite. The, in, any, in every government program, I used to call this uh, De Lorenzo's first law of government. Failure is success. The worse you do at teaching the kids in school, the more money we give the public schools. The, uh, the worse poverty becomes, the more money we, spend, we give the poverty bureaucracy, and on and on and on. So the worse you do, the more money you get. It's just the opposite of the market. And, and the whole history of railroads in America has been like that, has been I mean, corrupt because People always spend other people's money less carefully than they spend their own money, don't they? And so you could call it high-speed rail, but it, but we don't we already have some of these, and uh, and it will be determined by politics. You know where the routes go, uh, and every aspect of planning is not determined by the economic bottom line, which is to say pleasing consumers. It'll be determined by uh, political influences. 
And, uh, and who knows where that will lead to. It's, uh, we, we know it won't lead to efficiency, for that sure. So, uh, and the, so there is no such thing, you know, the argument that the governments always make about efficiency is, well, we're gonna make government more business-like. We're gonna run it more, we're gonna, we're gonna hire some retired CEO to run the high-speed train or something like that. But then that begs the argument. If you think being business-like is such a good idea, why not privatize it and let a real business operate you know why why are you playing business it's kind of like the market socialists during mises time who wanted to play capitalism who thought they could play capitalism it didn't really work out too well for the russians did it uh, it didn't really succeed so uh maybe one more question and our time is up uh, how about you yeah, he had his hand up for about four, <laughs> since i came into the room i think yeah, yeah. So uh, I just want to ask for context first is, uh, have you read Hoisman's book, uh, the, the, the Ethics of Money Production? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So my question is more about, in that book he argues that uh, low interest rates tend to lead to high, higher time preference behavior, which in turn also leads to um, you know, kind of state worship and, and the state becoming a bigger part of people's lives and then supporting bigger government policies. Would you say that 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 concept was probably Hamilton's main motivation for supporting the bank, seeing as he constantly wanted to undermine the Constitution? Or is it the uh, other way around? Yeah, I don't think Hamilton was anywhere near that sophisticated in his economic understanding. <laughs> as I said, like I said, he was an economic ignoramus. It, it really is remarkable that uh, the historians will tell you that it was Jefferson who was the economic dummy, and it was Hamilton. Jefferson translated the physiocrats into English. You know, he translated the French physiocrats into English. If you, uh, if you walk into Monticello tomorrow, uh, Thomas Jefferson's home, right by the front door, there's a, a big marble bust of Turgot, whose name is on the wall over one, one of his names, the French finance minister. And so uh, it's right over there somewhere, is it? Yeah, I remember seeing it. He's pointing at it. Yeah, it's right in front of me, right there. A R A R J Turgot, and so and so it was it was Jefferson who was very well schooled in the economics of his day, including Adam Smith, and uh, and it was Hamilton who was the big dummy who he read he read mercantilist pamphlets written by publicists for British slave plantation, uh, uh, you know, traders and. and uh, and it said things like uh, transportation cost is useless labor. That was, that was his, uh, his, his, the depths of his, you know, so I don't think, I don't think so. He, he just wanted government to be bigger and more activist. He, he disavowed Adam Smith's uh, uh, invisible hand theorem. He denigrated it. He sneered at it because he thought the economy had to be micromanaged by smart lawyers like himself. That's, that's my opinion of Hamilton. I think that's the extent of why, why he was such a, a busybody. And that's why, uh, that's why, and he was also very Machiavellian. You know, when he, he nationalized the national debt, uh, the, the, the debt for the war had been uh, put up by the states. The states incurred all the war debt. And some states like Virginia had almost paid off all their debt uh, from the war. Other states like Massachusetts had not paid hardly anything. And Hamilton uh, orchestrated the uh, nationalization of the war debt. And he let all the insiders in Congress know that these bonds that were selling for between two and 10% of par value would be purchased by the government at 100% par value. And so all the insiders, Congressman Robert Morris himself, Alexander Hamilton himself, went all over the country buying up all these bonds from war veterans at 2%, 5% of par value, and then cashed them in at 100% a few months later because for the students, uh, you have to understand this is before the internet. So, you know, information didn't flow as quickly as it did now. And Robert Morris is said to have made the equivalent of, I think it was $8 million in, in the deal. Uh, and Hamilton himself became uh, rich also with this deal. And that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, Jefferson despised him so much. He, he, he called it, uh, he was in favor of consolidation, meaning highly centralized state bottomed on corruption, based on corruption. And that's also why Hamilton wanted a central bank. He wanted a central bank to be able to use to buy political, political votes in the future because he understood this was a one-time deal. They, they getting all these members of Congress, making them rich with the uh, nationalization of the debt was a one-time deal, but they were going to retire and die 
And so if you want to keep this engine of statism going, you need a more permanent engine of statism, and that would be the bank. And that, that was Hamilton's reasoning for, for being such a champion of the bank. I don't think he understood interest rates or uh, economics at all. Time is up. Uh, time to go.